We're live on your DSTV channel 421, Go TV channel 144. This is Joy News Prime. Tonight, alleged poison on the menu as personnel of the Food and Drugs Authority racing against time to establish the actual cause of alleged food poisoning at Malco restaurant as its scientists fast track samples on materials in storage, raw materials and finished product to the for the lab for analysis. The following day, we had a diarrhea and vomiting since that day. We've been running for the past four days with, all, uh, with my children. Our toll workers demand reassignment and their four month arrears paid. It's not easy at all. We are even trying to look for a job. You go. Yesterday, for instance, I go to a place and the lady told me that the job I have, if I give you, you cannot do it. Also, resident of Kwabinya in the Ga East Municipal kick against the erection of a telecom mast in the area. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency says the telecom company leading the project failed to secure the necessary construction permit. Also, prime business and sports will come your way from 8 p.m. Charles, share headlines. Well, tonight, as government, you know, receives pressure from industry analysts to control inflationary rate, an analyst said the best way to cushion Ghanaians is to inject a price mechanism for full prices. The pricing control mechanism will slow down the growth or the increased rate in transportation. And already, after yesterday, we heard transport operators are even going to increase by 20%. So it will make the case very worse. And in sports. Well, former Black Stars midfielder Emmanuel Ajiman Bedu wants the Otuado led technical team maintained. The coach have done a very great job. Uh, the FA had done a lot of great job as well because after the African Cup of Nations, we all knew what happened. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on them, but they were able to map a strategy to calm nerves down and to qualify the nation for another World Cup. We are your home of independent, fearless, credible journalism. I am Samuel Kojobri. Stay with us. Now, the public is awaiting findings from the Food and Drugs Authority on the latest report of food poisoning at the Mawako restaurant. Officials of the authority earlier today took food samples as part of investigations into numerous complaints received from patrons of the fast food over the weekend. Some persons who allegedly ate meals from the kitchen of Mawako are still on admission at the hospital as they continue to feel sharp pains in the stomach. Now, even before the FDA findings, the victim claimed laboratory results confirmed a case of food poisoning. I've been speaking to one of the victims. On, on the day, I wanted to surprise my wife, so I ordered a food from Mawako. So as I ordered, the dispatch rider brought it to me. After eating it, the following day, we had a diarrhea and vomiting. Since that day, we've been running for the past four days with, all, uh, with my children. Too. So, mm. so, so all of you ate it? All of us. All of us, we ate it. Yeah. If, if one girl from other place ate it, this is the girl. She also had a diarrhea and vomiting. Mm. She's not part of my family. We are five years. She came to join us mm. Mm, because she wasn't able to go to school. So you are just eating and vomiting? I, I can't eat. You are vomiting. Vomiting and, and passing stool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah dehydrated. Mm. Yeah. yeah, dehydrated. So you have your symptoms. Let us understand what's wrong with you. I'm very weak. I can't eat. No, I don't know. I'm not strong. I'm very, very weak. Mm. Mm. When you went to the hospital, what did they tell you? They tell us uh, like something from the food. Mm. Yeah, something from the food. So they gave me an IV. Okay. Give us an IV. Yeah. Yes. That's what happened to all of you, your wife and your kids. Yes, yeah. yeah. Oh. All of you have been to the hospital. Yes, please. Where is your wife now? She's going to review. She's going to review. The same thing. Yeah, my brother came to pick us to the hospital, so everything is with my brother. Mm. How about the kids? They can't eat. They can't eat. This will have to force. You can't eat. Look at him. He's a very strong boy. Mm. I'll be switch. I want to see him. He can't eat. All of us, you can't do anything. Mm. This is the Mawako Fast Food Limited, their branch at East Legon. The branch has been shut down and therefore it is closed. Nothing is being stored here. 
Now, if you open and come inside, it's an empty restaurant because the FDA says suspend your, your operations and shut down in the meantime. So this is what you see when you come to the Marco fast food joint here in East Legon. But what do authorities of the company really make of what's happening? We'll be fine now soon. But if you're watching this, you see an empty space. All the people you are seeing here, the lady and gentleman on my right, uh, staff from the Municipal Health Directorate, the director and one of her staff. And then uh, the ones you see on my left are also people who are interested in what's happening here. They are not customers. So when you come here, you are basically not going to get anything to buy and eat. Well, the one who speaks for the entity is Mr. Lamte. He is still here with me. I want to find out from him some few things. Mr. Lamte, people will be asking, okay, so they had already planned to serve people. What's going to happen to the food that you had already prepared to serve? No, Kojo, I mean, what will happen, you, you know more than I do. And any individual knows that fast food, I mean, they don't have that kind of longevity. Okay, so I know it's going to cause us a lot of problem financially, even psychologically. Some of us are psychologically traumatized, but what can we say? But as I'm saying that all the four branches have been closed down. I mean, the monies that we're going to lose from this is immeasurable, is uncountable. In terms of in monetary terms, how much are we looking at? Oh, Kojo is huge. Kojo is huge. And because the technical guys, those who, who are involved in some of these things, we've discussed it, and the figure they are giving me is mind-boggling. It is something that if I mention it yourself, I know that you collapse. It's how, a, how much? Kojo is a huge amount of money. You are talking about thousands of Ghana City. Thousands of Ghana City. You know, even I can tell you the money that we spend in even helping some of the victims to pay their hospital bills, we've gone past some amount of money that we can't even believe it. How much have you spent on their hospital bills? That I'm sure you know. Kojo is huge. There are those that we supported them even today. We've, we've had, we have the list that we have to pay almost about 14,000 Ghana cities mm. for about five people in one hospital. Yeah. We've paid a lot of money. There were places that we paid about 20,000. There were places that would even paid about 2,000 and all that. So the money, we've not quantified the amount yet, but I'm saying that Maybe after our investigation, when we come out with our press release, we'll try to capture all this in our... Can you be close to 100,000 cities or 50,000? Uh, 100,000, no. But I think that we're just close to, let's say, 70,000. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. and, and when it comes to the meal preparation, spent uh, close to 300,000, I'm looking at your four branches. That one, I cannot give you an authentic information on that one, but it's a huge amount of money. Let's uh, see... And, and let you understand how the whole thing is. They're, they have another space up there. Let's try and find out um, whether or not, in fact, uh, the place has, has been announced uh, to have been shut down. Indeed, it has been shut down and nothing is happening. We've been around, but let's uh, take you up there so you can have uh, a view of how the place is. Absolutely empty. That's how the place looks like. So this is the upper floor of the Mawako Fast Food Limited here at East Legon. Now, some victims also spoke to join News on condition of anonymity. Mom started feeling uncomfortable around 3 in the morning, 3 a.m. the next day, so Monday, 3 a.m. Mm. I started feeling it later in the day on my trip. Okay. My younger sister started feeling in the morning as well on Monday. When you say you started feeling uncomfortable, what symptoms were you experiencing? Running, just visiting the loo. Every, everything you eat comes out. Yeah, we went to the hospital Monday evening. We were admitted Monday evening. And what did the hospital authorities say was the problem? We got to know it was food poison on Tuesday. But what did the lab result also say as in the type of food poisoning? Uh, he used the word... He said it's found in like Chinese fried rice. He used the word. He used the word. I, I don't recall the word, but he used the word to symbolize what was happening. And what samples were taken for for the lab? My blood. I think at that point we were just do. I think they were doing more. I don't see damage control, but we're running. We're weak. Uh, I think blood and you know just they were taking samples. 
we had a lot of eyes like drips and stuff being given because we kept on just using the glue, so they had to just give us the thing. But today we went, and today we they took us to they took urine and they took blood. How has the whole feeling been like for you? Difficult. I don't know if I'm safe to buy food outside because it's not like I usually buy food outside. But it was Mother's Day. It was a good day as well. You just want to go and get food and just celebrate your mom. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's been difficult. It's been horrible. Like it's been terrifying because it's not what you expect. I mean, I'm still in pain. Like I have to go for scans in a few days because my abdomen is. Is when you touch my abdomen, it really hurts. Oh, well, uh, um, you know, it was on Sunday, Monday, day, when a nephew of mine that I took care of his infant, and now who is happens to be a delivery guy. And so that very Sunday, I was in the house when he went to buy my uncle Jolof to take it with some coleslaw and brought it. So I was busy working to later to be when I was two. And you take the food, though it was still warm. I, and it was the last meal I took before going to bed. And later in the night, around um, like 12 a.m., I started experiencing a severe stomach pain. Then by 4 a.m., I feel like I'm going to the loop to cook it. So that was when I started running, running for weeks. As I keep it, you know, I'm going to go to the kitchen. Mm. Which hospital are you? Mm. So when you went to the hospital, after they conducted uh, their lab test, what did the lab results say? Uh, initially, on Monday when I went, uh, and they said the lab result was negative, but I was given treatment, so I came home. Even once I was under treatment, I was still having the same thing, running, leaving my bed, going to the washroom. But the doctor was like, when I came, when I come back home and I take the medication, I'll go. Now, joining us through Zoom is Bobby Bonson, who is a lawyer and executive director for the Bureau of Public Safety, um, uh, who is in the person of Nana Yao Akwada. They, we have the two of them online now. Let me start with you, Bobby Bonson. Um, what are the provisions in the law for victims of this alleged food poisoning? Good evening to you and your viewers, and thanks for having me. Um, my sympathies to those who have fallen um, victim or have had their health affected by this um, so alleged this, food poisoning. I, I don't think that anybody wishes it on, um, on, 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 on somebody who just went to a restaurant to, to buy food. Uh, with respect to the law, this is a situation that um, lawyers would call a definitely breach of duty of care to consumers. So it's a, it's a tortuous liability. And we would simply say that the restaurant owed the duty of care to its consumers and knew or ought to have known that a breach of this duty of care, if it results in any injury or damage, then the, the, the restaurant will be liable to compensate the, the victims for what ge- lawyers would call general damages and specific damages. Mm. So the specific damages will refer to the amounts that they have been, they will be able to quantify that they have incurred as a result of this damage. So for example, those who are speaking to hospital expenses, all the medical bills that they have paid, if they're able to prove that it's related to the food poisoning, the, and it's proved that the food poisoning was from the restaurant, then the restaurant will be liable to reimburse them with exactly the amount they have incurred by way of hospital expenses and maybe interest on that if need be. In addition to this specific expense or what lawyers will call special damages, the fact that they have breached the duty of care which has resulted in injury would occasion general damages to be paid by the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So that in addition to this um, specific amount, the, if they decide to go to court, the court may, looking at the circumstances of the case, order any amount at its discretion to be paid to the victims. It could range from one Ghana CD to 100 million CD, solely dependent on the, on the uh, discretion of the court. Mm. If the entity decides to say, I want to be proactive, what sort of options are available for it? Well, if, 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 I mean, if, if you're able to settle with them, I, I believe that's what you mean, that they want to be proactive. Mm-hmm. 
they I, I had their I think their officer or PRO that yes. you interviewed at the mm -hmm. site saying that they're actually paying the medical expenses of the victims. And I, 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 I was quite happy to hear that. That is a step in the right direction. And I believe that um, unless they are, the situation gets out of hand, they should be able to approach the victim, um, apologize, because I don't think with their reputation they would, okay. uh, they, they, would, they would aim to do this. And they should be able to find a fair settlement All right. on this. Uh, so hold, hold the line for me there. Let me turn my attention to you. The Executive Director of Public, uh, Bureau of Public Safety, Nana, some say this incident is a clear case of the FDA's lack of supervision. Do you agree to this? Uh, Nana, I'm, I'm told your uh, microphone is on mute kindly, uh, is, is on mute kindly, unmuted for us so we can hear what you say. Uh, Nana, um, welcome again. Uh, I don't know if you heard my question. I'm asking that some say this is a clear case of the FDA's lack of supervision. Do you agree? Well, good evening to your viewers. Let me um, also apologize to your viewers that I am in transit, and so they would have to forgive me if we get a few shakes in, um, in the pictures that, that that's, you that's very okay. show me. That, that's okay, Nana. Okay. So I think that it will not be fair mm. to lay blame uh, squarely or solely at the feet of the FDA. Mm. Look, the city authorities do issue health certificates, you know, one, for people mm. who prepare food for the public. That's the public health department of the city authority, like AMA, TMA, and the likes. Mm -hmm. Two, they issue sanitation permits to eateries, restaurants, I mean, um, bars. They issue sanitation permits to them. They also have to inspect their refrigeration systems and everything that concerns the food that they, they, they serve the public. The FDA also issues permits to these eateries. And so it is important to learn that if we want to um, lay blame at the feet of state institution. We've got to bring all these institutions together so that we do not leave people, you know, in the dark who are literally not doing what they are mandated to do. Well, so well, we no, no, just no, no. go and when, focus when on FDA to the and allow the municipal AMAs health and the TMAs who are on a daily basis collecting taxes from these institutions. Please go ahead. Yeah, when, when I was speaking to the Minister of Health Director earlier, she mentioned that Please all, go ahead. all their workers have been certified. I mean, they've been screened, which means that they have the, the permit to go ahead and do what they are doing. So it tells you that the assembly might have done something right. Well, certifying the workers is not all. I mentioned sanitation permits. Mm. When last was this particular joint, you know, inspected for its sanitation. Mm. When last was their refrigeration systems inspected? If these things have not been done right there, the city cannot absorb itself from, from, from this um, incident. I would want to see um, the city take on a lot more responsibility than to suggest that we have issued sanitation um, um, you know, health permits to all their workers. And so our job is done. Their job does not just end at issuing health permits to these people. In any case, those permits, are, they, they just examine them for communicable diseases. And that's all. Mm -hmm. Their mental state is not checked. So someone may be there and having mental issues, we don't know. Uh, I'm not suggesting the same, but I'm just saying that there's a deficit in the system they are, the, the sanitation permits may not have the, the kind of inspection that goes into the sanitation permit may not have been adequately exhausted, leading to this. Myself, I've suffered food poisoning before from the hands of one of these eateries. But in my case, the management did actually take very good and bold steps immediately to replace and to um, solve the problem when I pointed it out. And so these are teething issues that we need the city authorities come the FDA to start looking at it. The Ghana uh, Tourism Board 
they also issue permits to these joints. What do they look at before issuing permits? We must ensure that these permits and licenses that are issued to these eateries are not just money-making ventures, but they are actually um, processes that go in to make the public safer once they consume from these, these joints. Okay, um, hold the line for me. Let, let me return to uh, lawyer Kobe there. Now, is the regulator, the Food and Drugs Authority, entirely free from a possible lawsuit in this case, for, for example? Well, um, like, uh, if, if it is proven that indeed they were aware of this um, um, non-compliance with their, with their regulations, and they did not um, mm. take steps to remedy these non-compliance, mm -hmm. then you can say that they, as a public entity, they have uh, defaulted in discharging their public obligations and which default has resulted in what we are witnessing. So when you stretch the argument, uh, you, can, you, you can rope them in for also breaching their, their public duty. But that's, um, like uh, it's, it's been said, maybe a very long stretch because then they, might, they, could, they don't have to do inspection every day, I want to think. Mm. I think that they do random and they are uh, maybe periodically. So if they, if they did the inspection yesterday, and today something happened. Would you say that what do, if, if they had done the inspection today, then that wouldn't have happened? It becomes a, 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 a difficult uh, stretch. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, Nana, for consumers, what would you advise they be uh, on the lookout for in purchasing food from restaurants and other eateries that we have? Well, I think it's important that... Um, food consumers, people who consume food from public spaces are also minded environment from which they consume these foods. And then two, they must understand that it's a shared responsibility. So as and when they notice anything untoward in such eateries, they must also alert the public. Mm. Enough to always run to social media to make some of these complaints. It is absolutely necessary that we become a more responsible society and you know, engage some of these um, state institutions directly from time to time. It gets results, it gets results, and you never know which um, of your family members will be saved by actually actively or consciously engaging uh, some of these entities. I have mentioned the Ghana Tourism Authority I mentioned the Food and Drugs Authority, and I mentioned the city authorities. These authorities, once you engage them officially, that I went to this entry, I wasn't satisfied with um, their sanitation. I wasn't satisfied with their staff, how they carry themselves. It, the onus will be on them to take steps to visit and to mm. set, uh, verify these um, reports for themselves, give you feedback, so that in future, if something happens, they are able to use this as a, a fallback um, for their mandates. We have done it before in 2012 when the Bureau of Public Safety took an entry like this to, to the city authorities. They took them to court. It lasted so long, about eight or nine months, but eventually they did what was right. And so we encourage the public to also participate in this effort because your lawyer said, the lawyer said, all the, 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 the state institutions cannot be there every day. They okay. cannot be there every moment. But we are there every day, and we are there every moment. So we should be our own inspectors. Mm. Nana, thank you very much. Nana Akwada is with the Bureau of Public Safety. Now, moving on to another story. On Wednesday, the statistical service confirmed what you have been experiencing at the market already, that prices of goods and uh, services are skyrocketing at an alarming rate, pushing inflation to a historic 18-year high at 23.6%. Well, today the Finance Minister, Ken Ofreata, has been acknowledging the problem, but says it is a continental-wide uh, crisis. He admits the crisis has not left his government and that of others across the country at their wit's end. He has been addressing the media Thursday. Welcome. <laughs> and... Um, um... Um, and that's the ADB itself and the Africa Development um, Fund um, for 
um, concession loans. So typically about 3,500 participants attend the AGM. Um, given the COVID issues, we expect it to be about a third um, of that in terms of delegates. Um, and this year is also the 50th anniversary of the ADF. Um, so it coincides and it's also the 50th anniversary um, since um, the passing of um, our founding president in Chroma. Um, so we have all these global issues. We have the 50th anniversary of the fund, the 50th anniversary of the passing of Dr. Nkrumah, uh, and uh, we have the AFCFTA um, headquartered here. Um, so today, uh, 41 African economies um, are severely exposed to at least uh, one of three concurrent crises, um, rising food prices, um, rising energy prices, and tightening financial conditions. And finance ministers now call it, you know, the dreaded three Fs of food, fuel, and financial conditions. And that is just a ripple through um, all of Africa. Um, food prices easily about 34% higher. Uh, crude oil prices some 60% higher. Um, global inflation has risen. Um, we saw our numbers yesterday. Uh, moved to, I believe, 23.6% or so, um, and a good chunk of it being imported inflation. Um, so we truly um, are at our wit's end on the continent as to how to address um, these, these issues. He also gave an update on the impact of the measures government announced recently to address the economic crisis. With regards to once again, the results of um, the consolidation and the announcements um, about um, travel and reduction in salaries uh, and all of that, um, the controller uh, will be giving us a report to see. But it's really early days yet. But I think what was significant uh, was really the issue of sacrifice and recognition by leadership that these are difficult times and we should join. Sometimes it's not a quantum, um, but it's exercising uh, a sense that you are au fait with what is happening with your people and you are joining um, in it uh, to make sure uh, that you are all bed and sharing. And I think that may be the more important lesson. Uh, but it leads to a certain frugality uh, because now, you know, I went to the spring meetings with what, eight people um, as opposed to prior years that may be double or three times depending on all of the meetings because now Zoom has become a real part of our lives, you know. Um, so I think that signaling is what must be heralded and an acknowledgement that we are all one people and we should bed and share uh, and then the bonus will be the savings that will come out of it. Now the finance minister also appeared irritated by a question from Reuters correspondent who had asked him if he had changed his mind about going to the IMF for a bailout. Thank you very much. My name is Cooper, and I'm from Reuters. And uh, I would just like to know, uh, given the challenges from uh, ratings agencies and the difficulties in securing financing, after having attended the recent IMF and World Bank meetings, has your openness to seeking out financial assistance from the IMF changed at all? Thank you. I, I always wonder why, you know. So, Cooper, why, why that question? Um, and, and let's say there are two, I mean, we are members of the fund, is that correct? Um, and um, uh, there are two major um, points of intervention that we have from the fund, one being the advice that we get because of the you know phenomenal expertise that the fund has and then secondly um, these program interventions uh, which bring us some resources um, i think if you see from um, the budget that we constructed for 2022 and the subsequent announcements that we have done um, clearly the issue of ghana uh, having the capacity um, to think through the consolidation exercises 
and also discipline itself with regards to the 20, 30 percent cuts, etc., that you, we have shown. Um, clearly, uh, a direction that I guess, even in a sense, um, uh, the fund may be hesitant um, to, um, um, to, to push um, any further. Are still to come in the bulletin, toll workers demand reassignment and their four month arrears paid. It's not easy at all. We are even trying to look for a job. You go. Yesterday, for instance, I go to a place and the lady told me that the job I have, if I give you, you cannot do it. Now, the Ghana Toll Workers Group is asking government to pay arrears due them, month after the country's toll booth were removed. After scrapping road tolls in the latter part of 2021, the government promised to pay salary arrears due the workers and ensure they were reassigned. However, many of whom are people living with disability say this has not been the case. They have not received their monies in the past four months. The group's chairperson, Henry Dogbe, told Joy News that around 800 workers are struggling to make ends meet. After the government removed all road tolls across the country in November 2021, over 800 toll booth workers lost their jobs. They were to be reassigned by the government while some arrears due them were paid. The toll workers say this is yet to happen. After a meeting today at the Ministry of Roads and Highways, the workers claimed that the situation was badly affecting them. It's not easy at all. We are even trying to look for a job. You go. Yesterday, for instance, I go to a place and the lady told me that the job I have, if I give you, you cannot do it. Uh, I survive through my wife and friends because I don't have any work doing. You know, I was renting at Pubiman, but because of this, my time is due and I've been ejected from the room. My things are in someone's uncompleted building now. You see, my children are not going to school because of school fees and feeding fees and those staffs. Chairperson of the Ghana Toll Workers Group, Henry Dogbe, said the government should bring back road tolls since it has made no provisions to reassign them after scrapping the road tolls. But the workers, we are almost 800. Yes, we are calling for them. If they, they as promised in the budget statement that the workers will be reassigned and be paid until they are reassigned, if the reassignment will not come on, as we can see that it will not even come on. So they should call back the toll. So I will go into the toll and do the work. The Ministry of Roads and Highways, on the other hand, said it had no individual contract with the workers. However, plans are underway to fulfill the demand of the groups. Isaac J. Kwache is a deputy PRO of the ministry. Let's get this context correct. The ministry does not have any agreement with the individual contractors or collectors. We cannot deal, deal with them individually, but it is rather the company that employed them. But that notwithstanding, we are engaging with them to ensure that we we'll find a makeable solution to some of these um, squabbles. Currently, executives of the group are planning to engage its members on the new development as it waits on the ministry to act. Ifwa Aprekwa Boafo's report read to you. Now, the police in the northern region have begun investigations into an alleged rape case by two military officers. According to joint news sources, the victim and her husband were traveling along the northern command zone when their motorbike developed a problem. The source said that two military officers who accosted the husband and wife physically assaulted them and one allegedly dragged the woman into the bushes and forcefully had sex with her on a motorbike. Now, the source added that the suspect who raped the lady's name was mentioned as Sakite, adding that whilst he was dragging the lady away, his other colleague mentioned his name and asked where he was sending the lady. Confirming the incident, the Northern Regional Crime Officer, Superintendent Bernard Baba Ananga said, a complaint of an alleged rape has been made to the police. He added that 
The police has written to the Northern Command of the Ghana Armed Forces for the release of the two military officers to assist with investigations. He, however, declined further comment. Uh, yes, it's, uh, our attention has been drawn to an issue like that, which uh, a gentleman reported to us, and which we just commenced our investigation. Uh, we are yet to gather more facts and come out. Suspect in the Sefan rape case in the Savilgo municipality of the northern region has been charged with murder and he has been remanded into police custody to support with investigations. Superintendent Ananga said he was fished out after a year of investigation. Suspect learning that the victim had passed on went into hiding. So we sought for him. Subsequently, we got him arrested around the Baldiana area and then brought him to the office here. We charged him and then we had him before court. He was arrested somewhere around, looking at the, you see, he was uh, arrested on the 20th April 2022, as you see here, after running away for almost getting to a year now. And uh, he is on remand, assessing the investigations. The Northern Regional Police Crime Officer recounted events that led to the death of the 18-year-old who was raped by Abdul Fatal Yusuf. There was this uh, young girl uh, about 18 years or so who was attending a naming ceremony around Nabalada in the Diari area. Uh, along the line, she came to the roadside looking for means of transport to go there. And this gentleman surfaced on his bicycle, offered to give her a lift. The suspect persisted, and the victim, now deceased, joined the bicycle to the naming ceremony area. About halfway to the journey, this gentleman took a different route and took the girl straight to a place looks like a bush, raped this young girl, so the lady started bleeding. For the information we, when we interrogated the victim was that this particular gentleman forced her, and with the magnitude of the force involved in the rape, resulted in her bleeding excessively. She was admitted at Sabalugu uh, Clinic uh, Hospital where the doctors treated her. However, had to transfer her to TTH for further medical attention. It was at that place that she passed on. A 14-year-old boy has had an arm and a leg amputated as he battles for his life at the Nalerigu Baptist Medical Center in the Northeast region after he was reportedly attacked with acid by one Ibrahim Salifu. The father of the boy, Gideon Wundua, narrating the incident to Joy News said his son was accused of attempting to steal a bicycle. According to him, the boy was tied to a wooden bench and beaten with sticks for several hours before the acid was poured on him by the man and two other individuals. He was later dumped in a bush and was rescued by a good Samaritan who rushed him to the hospital. He remains in an unstable condition. Correspondent Elias Utanko has more in this report. The boy was allegedly attacked by a man identified as Ibrahim Salifu, a teacher at Nalirgo Senior High School. Doctors at the facility say the boy's condition was so bad that the only option to save his life was to cut off his one arm and a leg at the same time due to the severity of the damage caused by the battery acid. His father, Gideon Wundowa, narrates the incident which occurred at Nalirgo to join news. He told me that he was moving around picking scraps so he came and met a big uh, tin tomatoes, uh, they were empty ones, you know. So he, he picked them and they were plenty. So he, he, he rather used his bicycle, kept his bicycle over there and picked another bicycle from the house. 
so that he can go and sell them and come back. So he left the bicycle there and went and sold the, those things. When he was coming back, the man met him and said that he stole the bicycle. And he said, no, I do not steal it, but this is what happened. So that the man tied him and called some people. They put one drum here, one drum here, and then they put wood on top of the drums. They tie his leg and their hands and hung him. They were rolling him and they were hitting him. So he told them, oh, this was a This is what is happening. They did not listen. To so say that it happened around 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Up to in the night, 7 o'clock p.m. Before he said that they should bring the battery water. So when they brought the battery water, he put it on the boy's legs and the hands. As recounted by the father, the boy was out with a bicycle in search of metal scraps when he came across plenty of empty tomato cans. While contemplating how to convey the cans, he saw a bicycle parked in front of a house and because his bicycle does not have a carrier, he decided to leave it behind and go for the one that was parked without the permission of its owners. As he returned the bicycle to claim his, the man with the help of other attackers accosted and tortured him to unconsciousness over the accusation that he attempted to steal the bicycle. At the hospital, the boy was still confined with marks of the assault visible all over his body. He looks pale and emaciated, and doctors say he risks undergoing the amputation of the other leg. And the one who did that to him is, he's called Ibrahim Salif, a teacher at Nalegu Sine High. That's his name. The guy name is Fire Fire. That's what they call him at the Sine High there. But me, I have nothing to do, but I need justice. On his sick bed, the boy denied the allegation, saying the man dumped him in a bush after pouring the acid on him. <laughs> Police in Nalirgo arrested the man Ibrahim Salifu to face justice. But he was quickly released following an alleged interference by the Nalergu traditional authorities. The boy's father says he's unhappy with the way the police in Nalergu are handling the matter. According to him, the police investigation into the matter doesn't look promising, and he therefore calls for public support to get justice for his boy. And that's a very, very sad story there. We'll take a quick break, comic return, we'll bring you showbiz. And it's now time for us to bring you showbiz here on uh, the Joy Prime and the man I be is in the studio. With yes, me. yes, yes, yes. And today I spent better half of my morning mm -hmm. at the Ministry of Tourism, Arts and Culture. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's all because I, you know of Africella, right? Oh, yes, yes. Have you ever been to the festival? No, I haven't. But maybe this year I'll find time. This year I'll take you there. I personally Good. take you there. Good. Okay. Because this year, the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture has actually signed an MOU mm. with Afrochella mm -hmm. so that they could bring in a certain number of people. You know, December, people flood Ghana a lot. Mm. Yeah. They are looking at Afrochella bringing in a certain amount or number of people so that the tourism industry can make a lot of money. Well, this morning I was there at the signing of the MOU. Okay. And this morning, do you sign an MOU with Afrochella? Yes, our child has been supporting, bringing a lot of tourists in this country in the last six years. And we think that we good to appreciate and recognize them. So for this year, we're expecting one million tourists to come to Ghana, international tourists. That would generate $2.6 billion for the Ghana economy, create 250,000 jobs. Our child's role in this is bring 20,000 in December out of the one million. That's all. Well, how long is this, um, and this contract going to last for? As long as they are delivering. <laughs> We want results. Okay. As long as we we'll keep renewing it and going on. Okay. We want to make Ghana the hub of tourism in Africa. Ultimately, we want to get $5 billion every year with $2 million visitation every year. $5 billion. From 2024, we'll do it and create uh, 250,000 jobs per annum. Four years, 1 million jobs for Ghanaians. And uh, you believe Africella will bring in those numbers or you have other the, the events? No, we have a lot of events. Okay. Africella is just one of them. We have several events and we want to have them one and on. But Africella, we want to appreciate them. We'll do for many other groups. Babuchela is to be minimum 20,000 people in December. And next year, 
you increase it? The MOU with the Ministry of Tourism. Well, I mean, I think it's great for us to be able to solidify our, our relationship with uh, with tourism. They've been supporting us in several ways, but now we want to solidify and make sure that we're actually integrating into the fabrics of what tourism wants to do for the country and ensuring that we are aligned. Uh, so it just makes sense that we come in and we work with the with the with the tourism um, uh, ministries and the and the GTA to ensure that we are aligned and we're doing what we have to do to make sure that we are reaching Ghana's goals. Well, the ministry is looking at you giving bringing in numbers well over twenty thousand people into the country. Are uh, we up for that? Yes, I mean, over the past six years, we brought in over 60,000 people just for the festival, not to mention all the people that have come out throughout the year. Um, in 2019, we had 16,500 people. I think an uh, extra 3,500 people is not too much to ask for. Our, our goal is to be able to do that over two days uh, this year, and we're very confident that with the ministry support um, and the support that we've been receiving from the diaspora worldwide, we'll be able to reach those goals. Well, the corona pandemic really affected everything, and I know Africella was also affected last year. I mean, some numbers turned up this year. What are you looking at? Um, our expectation actually was actually 20,000 because we're doing two days this year, so it aligns with just what the minister told us this, afternoon, this morning. Okay. Well, what is the date for this year's festival? Uh, the dates are December 28th and 29th. We've always been December 28th. This year we're adding the 29th. We want to bring some more flair to the vibes. Yeah. Same venue? Same venue. You know, uh, when we started at LWAC, a lot of people told us why we shouldn't go to LWAC. And, and now we, it's become a very staple part of our, of our culture and, and what we bring to the table. And it shows how we can elevate community localities that people may not uh, see in the light that we've been, been able to make LWAC look like for Africa as well. So there you have it, 28th, 29th. It's always been 28th, but this year mm -hmm. they are adding 29th. So it because they believe two days. that two days mm -hmm. because they believe that they are going to rob in more numbers. Mm -hmm. There is no COVID, so uh, that one is going to give them the flexibility of the numbers. Mm -hmm. so but you and I are too. Yeah, you and I. I know. <laughs> And today, the former Black Star for uh, the former captain for Black Star, that is Asamoah Gyan, was also unveiled as a tourism ambassador at the ministry. Well, I was there, and the minister is looking at Asamoah Gyan being able to sell Ghana, both local and international wise, because or due to his network that he has built. What actually inspired him becoming a, deciding on him as a tourism ambassador? You know, he's been the most prolific goal scorer. He scored the most goals in Africa in the World Cup uh, series. Like they said, he took up for Jamila, who had it for 25 years. So we think that uh, apart from scoring the highest number of goals, he's demonstrated on the field that he loved Ghana. He's known globally. He has contacts, he has networks. So we think that we have to honor him first for his exploits and uh, contributions to Ghana and take advantage of his network and skills to promote Ghana and let Ghana be on the map and encourage tourists to come to Ghana. That's so how long is he going to be an ambassador for and exactly what is expected of him? We expect him to use his network. There are two fronts. One is domestic tourism. We want to have every year at least one million Ghanaians going around tourist sites in the country to see our tourist attractions. That's one. So you encourage Ghanaians. When he goes out and it shows that he's visiting Mole Game Reserve, uh, Mole National Park, or Zulezu, or any place, Ghanaians, young people in particular, would be encouraged to also go around. When we do that, we are encouraging each other to learn each other's culture and also generate and excite the local economy. When people go to any place, they spend money, they stay there, they buy things, and that's energizing the local economy and creating jobs for the people. That's domestically. International is going to use network to let people know that Ghana is peaceful, Ghana is attractive, come and visit Ghana, thereby creating jobs. Congratulations, Captain. Thank you, thank you. How's the feeling like already? Yeah, I feel good. You know, um, as everybody knows, I've been patriotic since, you know, so um, me being part of um, tourism, um, I, I, although I'm happy, I say it's a normal thing to me because I'm a very patriotic citizen, you know, and I'm here to serve the nation and everything, you know, so work starts now. I can't wait to, to, to start work. Well, this is something you've been doing. I mean, everywhere you go to play your trade as a footballer, you already take Ghana, you put Ghana on the map. And um, not to say that you are the only striker with the highest number of goals, if not on the African continent in Ghana here. Exactly. What, the minister has told me exactly what they are expecting of you. What are you bringing? 
what what new thing are you going to do? Because you've been doing this job already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, although I've, I'm, I'm doing job at the other side, you know, um, this uh, is a new journey to me. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to combine my experiences and then a new journey that I'm embarking, you know, to, to make sure we, we have success. You know, at the end of the day, it's Ghana everybody's looking for. So I will do my best to, to make sure um, I use my experience, I use my popularity and so he's going to use his experience in popularity and network to sell Ghana, both locally and on the foreign market. All right, and so that's how we wrap up today's edition of the headline news at uh, the Joy Prime news that came to you from uh, here at Coco Mlemle. There's more news at myjoinline.com. My name is Samuel Kojo Brace. Uh, Prime Business is up next.